and will have an abundance of needs, especially young children. As they get older, it's less cute and so it's more annoying, so you tell them to go away. But young children will have an abundance of needs, and some are important, some aren't. You know, sometimes it's a real emergency, and sometimes it's only a perceived emergency. The amount of emergencies that my children have that are just nothing. It's funny and cute, but sometimes annoying. But day in and day out, they come to you and they ask. Without fear and without hesitation, they ask. This morning, we're looking at the importance of being persistent in prayer. Much like our children, who are persistent when they need something, so too ought we be in our prayer life. So I'd like to read through again quickly that parable that Pastor Mark just read and spend some time looking at it. <clears throat> again, it's Luke 18, 1 to 8, if you haven't already turned there. It says, And he told them a parable to the effect that they ought always to pray and not lose heart. He said, In a certain city there was a judge who neither feared God nor respected man. And there was a widow in that city who kept coming to him and saying, Give me justice against my adversary. For a while he refused, but afterwards he said to himself, Though I neither fear God nor respect man, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will give her justice, so that she will not beat me down by her continual coming. <laughs> and the Lord said, Hear what the unrighteous judge, judge says. And will not God give justice to his elect who cry to him day and night? Will he delay and lose delay and long will he delay long over them? I tell you, he will give justice to them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? Do you know what's really annoying when you're a preacher? Not as a pastor so much, but when you're when you're a preacher, you believe you understand the text that you're going to be speaking on and you have like a direction that you want to take it and you're, you're going to go. But as you start to study, all of a sudden you come across something that's like completely contradictory to where you're going. So as I was studying this, I came across Wiersbe's expository outlines of the New Testament and he says this about this parable that we just read. He says, The parable is not urging us to pester God until he acts. It is saying that we do not need to pester him because he is already, he is ready and willing to answer our prayers. You're like, oh, okay, well we're saying like be persistent in prayer. And where's B? He's like, no, you don't need to be persistent. You don't need to pester God because he's already willing. So what do we do? How do I, how do I go forward with my sermon? I guess we're done. Drive safe. <laughs> Good luck. Now, the truth is, that the context behind this parable, it's actually even more than that. The context behind this parable is being persi persistent in prayer, absolutely, but in regards to the second coming of Christ. So when we just read it in the context that we find it in, we can absolutely draw out being persistent in prayer. But if you look back at chapter 17, Jesus is speaking to the apostles specifically, and he's specifically talking about the, his return. And then he goes on to tell them this parable and says, be persistent in prayer. And, and the natural, logical conclusion, and, and we know this, is that he's actually talking about be persistent in praying for the speedy return of Christ and his kingdom. With that in mind, however, it is not incorrect to read this parable and come to the conclusion that we must be persistent in our own personal prayer lives as well. We're going to make that point a little bit more clear in, in the third point. Uh, and I can only assume, but I believe that what Wiersbe is getting at is the point that I was making in my intro. When a child is constantly pestering you for something that isn't really important, right? Like, where did I leave my socks? Versus when a child is persistent in coming to parents to fulfill their actual needs. I'm hungry. I've got a scrape on my knee. I need some help with this. R.C. Sproul writes in his notes, he says, The widow was a helpless person with nothing but right on her side. She wanted justice, not revenge. Jesus made my job easier with this parable, and it's always nice. Uh, one of the things that we know when studying parables is parables have one point, and often it's left to us to, uh, with the tools that we have, come to an understanding of what that one point is. But Jesus makes it very clear. He, he made it easy. Uh, this morning I was supposed to explain it, but he did write in verse 1. He says, And he told them a parable to the effect that they ought always to pray and not lose heart. Right, so we don't, have to, we don't have to go and think, what is this parable getting at? What is he talking about? Jesus says, always pray and don't lose heart. And we're going to come back to that not losing heart thing in verse 3, because I think there's, there's some significance behind that. Then, he further explains at the end of the parable, in case you forgot who God was, in case you read this parable and you're sitting there thinking, do we really serve an unjust judge? Is, is God unjust? 
Jesus reminds us in verse 6, he says, And the Lord said, Hear what the unrighteous judge says, and will not God give justice to his elect who cry to him day and night? Will he delay long over them? Because we have a good and righteous God whom we can bring our prayers to, and like a child who understands that we can continually go to their parents for help, we can and should continually be going to God with our needs. This time we'll turn it back over to Mark. So I have the task in point two here of focusing in on verse eight of this parable. The first sentence of verse eight says that God will give them justice speedily. Which raises the question, why do we need to pray persistently if the answer is coming speedily? Anyways, and the stories that we hear and stories that many of us have lived out, it, it sometimes seems like we pray for something and the answer comes quickly, but it often seems like you've got to pray persistently, sometimes for years before the answer comes. To use Francis Chan's example from my introduction, was his, his prayer for his friend answered speedily? when he prayed for 30 years for his friend to become a Christian and put his faith in Christ? Or does God have a different definition of speedily compared to you and I who think that speedily is just, you know, zapped 30 seconds quickly in the microwave? As a matter of fact, yes, God does have a different definition of speedily than you and I do. We're always in a rush. But God is never in a rush. We want to get things. We can get so frantic. We want them right now. In fact, we want them yesterday. But God is never frantic. God is never worried. God doesn't get frantic. We are not in control and we want to be in control. But God actually, he is in complete control. And he's calm. And he's not in a rush. With God, according to 2 Peter 3 verse 8, one day is as a thousand years and a thousand years is as one day. Which speaks to the fact that God is sovereign over time and that his perspective on time differs radically from yours and mine. 30 years is a short period of time compared to 30 million years. 30 years of praying is nothing compared to 30 million trillion zillion years and on from that into eternity. But there is more to the answer than that because he will give them justice speedily does not just mean answer their general persistent prayer but also it's ultimately referring to Jesus triumphing over evil at his second coming as Pastor Inza made mention about this parable is not just about persistent prayer in general though it's certainly about that and, and good to draw that principle and teaching out of it as we're doing this morning but ultimately this is parable is about the end times the return of Christ when John MacArthur preached on this sermon coincidentally he preached on it the first Sunday of December himself a number of years ago though and he titled the sermon persistent prayer for the Lord's return because that's the that's the real context Remember, when the Bible was originally written, there were no chapter divisions in it. Chapter divisions were put in later on to help us find places, put in actually in the year 1227 to find, help us find particular sections faster. But if there was no chapter division between chapter 17 and chapter 18, we'd see them more flowing along. And in chapter 17, it talks about the return of Christ and how his return will be, be like lightning across the sky. And, and then we'd read this parable and we'd read that it's about the second coming as well as evidenced most clearly by verse 8 here when it says will not he give justice to his elect to cry out to him day and night and will he find faith on the earth when he returns when the son of man comes the Greek word for this word speedily here in Luke 18 8 is the word takas which is often used in the Bible about Jesus second coming it's about Christ's return often but of course Christ's second coming has not come speedily or quickly from our perspective. It's been 2,000 years since Jesus first came as a baby, lived a perfect life, died on the cross to pay for our sins and rose again. 2,000 years doesn't seem like speedily to us and, and Christ could return at any moment, could return in our lifetime, but it could be another 2,000 years or more before he returns. It might not seem speedily to us, but again, God has a different definition of speedily and of time. Let me read to you the whole Second Peter chapter 3 paragraph from verse 8 to 13. You can turn there if you like. I'll read it to you because it explains, also explains the reason why Jesus hasn't returned yet. He could return right away, speedily, by our definition as well, but he hasn't returned yet and it says it's because he wants more people to come to repentance. 
before he returns, which in the context of Second Peter, the repentance spoken of is the Christians repenting of following after the false teachers. But of course, also God wants more non-Christians to come to that initial repentance and saving faith before he returns once and for all. Which is also, if you're here this morning and have not put your faith in Jesus Christ, that is what we want for you. We want you to put your faith in Jesus Christ before it's too late. When Christ does return, or if you die before he returns, at those, two, at those points, it would be too late. So we encourage you, do not put it off, but trust in Jesus today if you have not already. The reason he hasn't returned yet is so that you'll have this moment to turn to him. Here's 2 Peter 3, 8-13. to But do not overlook this one fact, beloved, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years and a thousand years as one day. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, and then the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved, and the earth and the works that are done in it will be exposed. Since all these things are thus to be dissolved, what sort of people ought you to be in lives of holiness and godliness, waiting for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be set on fire and dissolved, and the heavenly bodies will melt away as they burn. But according to his promise, we are waiting for a new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. So that Greek word takas, or speedily, it might not seem speedy to us, but it does to God. And additionally, there's a sense in this word, takas, there's a sense that when it begins, then it takes place from start to finish, speedily and rapidly and quickly and completely. When the time comes, when Christ does return, when it happens, it will be fast, like lightning and like a thief in the night. The heavens will pass away with a roar. Speedy, rapid, quick, swift, complete will be the return of Christ when it comes. And then just quickly in the final sentence of Luke chapter 18, verse 8, Jesus says, Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? When, the, when Christ returns, Son of Man is his favorite term for, him, for himself. When Christ returns at the second coming, will he find faith? Will there be faithful people who still have faith in Jesus as evidenced by the fact that they have kept praying persistently their whole life? Will there be faithful people on earth? Or will people have given up waiting and they'll say, oh, it's been too long, he's not coming back, and their faith will have grown cold or grown stale or stagnant or even be non-existent? And that's, so this part of the parable, this sentence, it's a challenge for us and for all people to ever live and follow after Christ to keep strong in the faith until the very end. It's a challenge for us. I trust that by God's grace, my faith and your faith will still be strong, whether Christ returns a couple months from now or not until we're 100 years old, or perhaps we will pass away first before he returns. May our faith remain strong. When Christ returns, will he find faith on the earth? People like us and churches like ours that are faithful to God and to the gospel and to his word, Perhaps churches like ours will be a smaller minority. People, Christians, will be a smaller minority at the time when Christ finally returns. But let that not phase us if that's, if that's the case. If you have a particular end times view called post-millennialism, you might think actually that there's going to be more faithful churches at the time that Christ returns. Either way, the call for us is to make sure that we are faithful as evidenced by persistent praying right till the very end. So now let's get back into more the, the actual point of persistent praying in general, and I'll pass it over to Pastor Ienza for that, and we'll look at some additional scriptures that teach persistent praying. So as I was preparing, I was kind of explaining to Margaret what I was thinking and where I was going, and as I was explaining my my upcoming illustration that I'm about to share with you. She told me I use it a lot and that I shouldn't use it. I didn't think I did, and I'm going to use it because I like it. Um, but I, I like to know 
from time to time how much is written about topics that I teach on. So the, obviously the, the best way to figure out how much is written, how much is said about a certain topic is to go to Amazon.com because they're the authority on how much is written. So I, I searched prayer in books to see how many books were written, at least that Amazon carries on prayer. I got 50,000 results. Um, so it's quite a lot. I was, I didn't search like Christian prayer or evangelical prayer. So that means I didn't have 50,000. As I scrolled through, there was definitely, a, there was a lot of Catholic stuff. There was a lot of Muslim stuff. And, but I was pleasantly surprised to see that the th first three books actually were written by uh, solid evangelical uh, Christian authors. It was, um, Timothy Keller had the first one, Charles Stanley had the second one, and, and Richard Foster had the third one. So I was like, all right, go, go evangelicals, we're winning. Um, <laughs> but I was kind of scrolling through, and I, I made it to page seven before I, I gave up my pursuits, and I didn't come across, and I, I wasn't really expecting to see, but I was hoping to see you know, the Bible. I never did. I was like, man, the ultimate book on prayer is, is scripture, is the Bible, right? But it wasn't in there. Uh, disappointing. Well, there was a Catholic prayer Bible, but I don't think that counts. Um, so, but many like you, I'm sure, have read a lot of stuff on prayer. Anybody here? Show of hands. We're going we're gonna to do like high school like Bible study time. Anybody here read a book on prayer that's not the Bible? A couple people. Good. All right. Um, I've read a number. <clears throat> I've read uh, books on when to pray. I've read books on how to pray, what to pray, why we should pray. I read a book on the posture of prayer, the posture in which we should take while we pray. Um, I read a book that told me that if you're praying for healing, and not in a Benny Hinn kind of way, but in a, in a legitimate, you want to see God do some healing, that you should visualize you know, this like supernatural blue beam of healing coming from God. I thought that was kind of weird. Um, but I've read a lot of stuff on prayer over the years, and there's been some really good stuff in my prayer life has been challenged and encouraged by it. But there's been like 50,000 books is a lot of stuff, and there's been some less than good stuff. And, and one thing that came to mind um, when I started to think about this message was something that I read, which was, again, in the exact opposite direction of the message that we're taking. I don't remember who the author was, and I don't remember what bucket was in. I have my suspicions, but I'm not sure, so I'm not going to say. Um, but essentially, the thesis, if you will, was that we ought to only pray for something once. So, you want to see your friend get saved? You pray for him once. And his point was that any more, and that was a sign of lack of faith. You didn't trust that you had fully given it over to God. You didn't trust that God heard your prayer, that God was listening, or that God cared about your prayer. And so if you kept praying, it was he was arguing that it was a, at least in some situations, it was a sign of weakness in your faith, and it, and it was a sign of weakness in your ability to trust God. Of course, I read that and I thought, great. So I remember back in 1997, I prayed for supper one time, so now I've asked God to bless this food to my body so I no longer have to pray before meals again. Only got to pray once, right? I th no, okay, I thought that was funny. That was, that was a joke. Um, and, I, and I am joking because the fact is the Bible doesn't teach that we should only pray once for something. In fact, the Bible teaches and models persistence in prayer. So I'd like to look at a couple of examples. There's a lot, um, but we're just going to look at a few. So if you will, turn with me to Luke 11. We'll be dealing with uh, verses 5 through 10. Luke 11, 5 through 10. And it says, Then Jesus said to them, Suppose you have a friend, and you go to him at midnight and say, Friend, lend me three loaves of bread. A friend of mine on a journey has come to me, and I don't have food to offer him. And suppose the one inside answers, Don't bother me. The door is already locked. My children are in bed. I can't get up and give you anything. I tell you, even though he will not get up and give you the bread because of friendship, yet because of your shameless audacity, he will surely get up and give you as much as you need. So I say to you, and it will be so I say to you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the doors will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, the one who seeks finds, and the one who knocks the door will be open. I use the NIV, um, I don't normally use the NIV, but I use the NIV in this today because I like the picture that it paints in, in verse 8. It says, I tell you, even though he will not get up and give you the bread because of friendship, 
Yet because of your shameless, ado- shameless audacity, he will surely get up and give you as much as you need. Right? The guy outside was persistent, banging on the door. Please come, please give me some stuff so that I can take to my friend. Um, verse 10, it says, For everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds. And again, I think that uh, that's a great picture of seeking, right? Who here has lost something? Typically, you don't find it right away. If, if you're, you know, the, the picture that we get with seeking isn't, Oh, I lost my wallet. Oh, here's my wallet, right? It's a picture of looking and not giving up and continuously looking until you find what you need. Persistence is important. Turn with me now to the Old Testament. We're going to go to 2 Samuel 12, 15 to 23. 2 Samuel 12, 15 to 23. I'm going to read the whole thing. It says, After Nathan had gone home, the Lord struck the child. I'll, I'll just backtrack quickly. This is the story of David and Bathsheba. And this is when David was found in sin and Nathan came and approached him and told him, uh, because you've sinned, the child is going to die. The child that he got, he got Bathsheba pregnant, that child was going to die. So this is picking up right after that. And says, after Nathan had gone home, the Lord struck the child that Uriah's wife had born to David and he became ill. David pleaded with God for the child. He fasted and spent nights lying in sackcloth on the ground. The elders of his household stood beside him to get him up off the ground, but he refused. He would not eat any food with them. On the seventh day, the child died. David's attendants were frightened to tell him that the child was dead, for they thought, while the child was living, he wouldn't listen to us when we spoke to him. How can we now tell him that the child is dead? How do we do something? He may do something desperate. David noticed his attendants were whispering among themselves, and he realized that the child was dead. Is the child dead, he asked. Yes, they replied, he is dead. Then David got up from the ground. After he'd washed and put on lotions and changed his clothes, he went to the house of the Lord and worshipped. Then he went to his own house, and at his request they served him food and he ate. His attendants asked him, why are you acting this way? When the child was alive, you fasted and wept, but now that the child is dead, you, you get up and you eat. He answered, while the child was still alive, I fasted and wept. I thought, who knows? The Lord may be gracious to me that the child may live. But now that he is dead, why should I go on fasting? Can I bring him back again? I will not go to him, but he will return to me. I will go to him, but he will not return to me. Sorry. Um, I use the story of David because I think that it's important to understand that even though David was persistent in his prayer, and not just in praying, but in fasting, right? He didn't get the response from God that he wanted. The parable of the widow and the example of the friend knocking at the door show that the persistency shows that through persistency you'll get what you want, or at least what you need. But that isn't always the case. Yet David knew that God was good, and so he still went and worshipped God. I appreciate, and I, I mentioned this before, but I appreciate it in Luke 18, 1, Jesus says that, in the, says that the parable is to teach us the way to pray and not to lose heart. I have known a lot of people who have prayed for a lot of good things and didn't get the results that they were hoping for. I've certainly experienced that. I'm sure many of you have experienced that. Praying for sick friends or loved ones or, or friends, family to return to Christ. That doesn't mean that we should abandon our faith. I think one of the struggles is when we don't get the response that we want, even through persistence and prayers, is it, it leaves us wondering, did God really hear? Does God really care? David knew full well that God was good. David went through a horrible experience and knew full well that, that God was good. And his response when not getting the answer he was hoping for was to worship. Christ tells us not to lose heart. Lastly, in Colossians 4, 2, it says, devote yourselves to prayer, being watchful and thankful. And again, Ephesians 6, 1, 18 says, And pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for the Lord's people. Are we people of persistent prayer? Do we pray continuously? Do we pray for our own desires? A couple of weeks ago, I, I preached on, um, I had the charts up there, if you remember, it's, it's what do people pray for versus what should we pray for? Are we like the child who's praying f- because we can't find our socks and we need some help? Or are we like the widow who has righteousness and justice on her side, who's seeking what is good and what is just? Are we praying persi- persistently for our friends who don't know Christ or for our coworkers that don't know Christ? 
I think that's a challenge today. Is, is one of the last things I read, and, and this is in my notes, so if I get it wrong, it's too bad, but one of the last things I read was um, as we draw closer to God in our personal walks, we'll stop praying for our own desires and our own needs. And as we start to line up with what God's will is and God's desires for our life, then we'll begin to pray those things. Right? We'll be less concerned with God. Can you please provide me with enough money so I can take my family on vacation? And we'll begin to pray, God, can you please help me be bold so I can share my faith with those around me? Are we being persistent in what is good and what is just and what is right in our prayers? We'll turn it back over to Pastor Mark for the conclusion. So in conclusion, let me ask you again, is there someone that you have been praying for that you have been tempted to stop praying for? Or maybe you, maybe you have stopped. Maybe you used to be praying for a family member or a friend or a neighbor. You used to be praying regularly, persistently. And at some point, you kind of gave up. Today is the day to stop giving up and to start praying persistently once again. Luke 18 is obviously a parable teaching us to pray and not lose heart. That's what verse 1 says. Pray and don't lose heart. That's the point of the parable. There is more to the parable than just that. As we've talked about, the parable actually has to do with the second coming of Christ. But this morning, mainly we're talking about persistent, persevering prayer. Never giving up. Always keeping on. Unrelenting. Continual prayer for that person in your life, that situation, don't give up. Persist in prayer. Sometimes we, we who believe in God's sovereignty can, can accidentally kind of in the back of our minds throw up our hands and say, well, whatever God wants to have happen is going to happen. God's in control. We, we don't really need to pray that much. But listen, the God who is in control is the God who wrote the Bible and said, we do need to pray that much. We do need to pray persistently. And he answers prayer when we pray persistently. So don't just throw up your hands and say, well, whatever will be, will be as though we're fatalists. No. Read what the Bible says about prayer and pray continually. Be devoted to prayer, persistent in prayer, daily, regularly, multiple times a day. Whenever that person comes to mind, pause and pray. Don't just fall into a fatalistic mentality that prayer doesn't matter. It does matter. It's all over every page of the scripture. We've been going over this for weeks. So many examples in the Bible and in our lives, in the church history, in the lives of people we know where God answers prayer when it's prayed persistently. And it's in line with God's will and it's prayed with faith and the different things we've gone over in this series. We see taught in this parable of the persistent widow and we see in the Bible constantly that we need to pray persistently. So let's close the sermon in prayer, praying that God would empower us to that end. And then we'll sing a song together before celebrating the Lord's table together. Heavenly Father, help us to pray persistently. Help me, Lord. Help each one here individually when we're praying on our own, praying with our family, praying together as a church family and small groups to, to not give up praying for those difficult people in our lives or unsaved family members and friends and neighbors, difficult situations that we've maybe been in for years, praying for change in our own lives. Lord, help us to persist in prayer. Empower us as a result of, of your word that we have shared together this morning. Empower us to persist in prayer. And Lord, as I, as I think of unsaved family members and friends, and probably we all have somebody on our mind at the moment that we're thinking of who is an unsaved family member or friend, Lord, we just in our own hearts and minds want to lift that person or those people up to you right now. Lord, we pray that they would come to saving faith. Reveal yourself to them. Draw them to you. Give them no rest until they have rested in you. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen.